All right, thank you all for cooperating with the, the postcard distribution. Um, I'm Anne, and I'm from UNC Charlotte. And today I'm gonna tell you about some work that my group and I have done connecting integrated genome browser to a huge genome database using its open API. And let's see, how do I move the... Oh, oh there we go. Thank you, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so I don't really have time to tell you a lot about Integrated Genome Browser, so please take a photo of this slide. Um, it takes you to a uh, information about a almost weekly uh, help session that um, we've started doing. Um, it's the host is Paige Kultzer, who's our trainer and data manager. Also, you can get the slides from today from this other link. What is Integrated Genome Browser? It's free, it's open source, which is why we're here. You, the way it works is you go to our website and you download it and install it onto your computer and you run it there. So it's a native application, not a web-based application. So what is a genome browser? A genome browser is software that displays data in the context of a genome assembly and annotation. So most genome browsers display genomic sequence, usually some reference gene annotations, often published experimental data, and most of them have the capability to display your data. So you can either upload it or open it in a local application. It's pretty easy to do. There are many genome browsers, and there's a reason for that. They're important. We need them. Um, there are kind of three categories of genome browser. There are website-based genome browsers, like the UCSC genome browser. There are native applications that run on your desktop, like integrated genome browser. And there's some kind of cool hybrids, like JBrowse, because it can run on a, as a website and it can run as a local application. So why do we need genome browsers? Well, if you use a genome assembly in some way to process data, then you absolutely need to look at the data in a genome browser. Number one, you need to check for flaws um, in your experimental data, like sample switching, for example. That happens a lot. Look for red flags. Hopefully, if your data are just fine, you need to look at the you need to look at the data and interact with it in a genome browser to notice trends and patterns that you wouldn't have found using purely quantitative methods. And also, and this is the most important part in my in my view, is you need to be able to compare, easily compare your results to what other people have found. Why integrate a genome browser? Why should you take a look at our software? Well, first of all, we've designed it primarily to provide interactive data analysis capability for people who are doing experimental, doing experiments, looking at their own data. And the way we've done that is we've emphasized fast, fluid movement and navigation in, in, the, in the browser. We've implemented a lot of visual analytics algorithms, and that just means that you can manipulate how things look in order to highlight pertinent aspects. We also make it possible to link out from things that you see in the genome browser to other resources, websites like Google and NCBI. And this is important because if you find something interesting, if you find a really cool trend, you need to be able to see if anyone else has seen it before. And then lastly, you need to be able to compare in our opinion, we need to be able to compare results from different experiments in different laboratories to do better science. So I'm going to show you some examples of this, starting with the first postcard that looks like this. Um, the postcard is showing an experiment that investigated um, gene expression changes in response to DNA damage treatments, DNA damaging treatments, in an organism called a tardigrade or a water bear. And these are microscopic animals. They are found, there's lots of species of them, and they're found everywhere on Earth. And what makes them kind of special and interesting to a lot of people is that they're able to tolerate very extreme stresses. Some people say they can even survive in outer space. And a lot of people have done RNA-seq experiments testing the effects of DNA damaging agents on gene expression in an effort, in an effort to try to figure out why tardigrades are so good at tolerating extreme stresses. And also there are some draft genomes assemblies available. So what you're seeing here is graphical representation from the genome browser of two experiments, two RNA-seq experiments that happened in completely different labs. So the top four tracks show you a coverage graph four coverage graphs from uh, treatment samples on the top, blue, and control samples on the bottom, green. The bottom quartet, same thing. Treatment samples are the orange graphs, and then controls are the green graphs. So 
probably you've already noticed that there's a place in this scene where there's peaks in the, in the treatments and nothing happening in the controls. So long story short, there is a gene in this region that's upregulated in response to DNA damage. And that the gene that's doing this interesting thing is annotated as encoding a DNA repair protein. So we have seen the same result, more or less, two different labs that were working completely independently of each other, one in North Carolina and one in Paris, France. And so because we see essentially the same thing in two completely different experiments, we can believe it more. It's probably not an artifact. So here's the second example. This one's a little bit more complicated. So what you're seeing here is a graphical representation of three gene models coming from a locus called MEOX1. This is an alternatively spliced human gene that encodes a DNA binding protein. There are um, three splice variants for this gene annotated in RefSeq, one of our wonderful databases of gene structures. And according to their annotation, alternative splicing um, is, uh, uh, produces two different types of transcripts, one that is skipping an exon and one that has the exon in it. And this exon encodes part of the DNA binding domain. And when the exon is removed, it doesn't interrupt the reading frame, it still encodes the the same start and end of the protein, but it probably can't bind DNA because it's missing part of the DNA, di binding, uh, DNA binding domain. So here's another picture, a lot more complicated than the first, and this is one of the postcards that you saw. So we're seeing two, um, we're seeing the, the gene models down at the bottom in the track labeled RefSeq curated, and we're seeing two very different data sets made at completely different times. The top one are alignments between cDNA sequences and the human genome. And this is data that is coming in via a REST API from the UCSC Genome Browser API, from the Genome Browser system. And these are all data that came from many different labs, many different EST projects. Back in the day, we used ESTs to annotate, hum annotate uh, gene structures in genomic DNA. Below that is a much more modern data set, RNA-seq read alignments from around 2020 imported from our system, uh, IGBY, uh, IGBY Quick Load API. It's a different kind of system. So we've got very old data and very modern data. And it's a little hard to tell at this level of resolution, but they're basically saying the same thing about this gene. What they're saying, here's a picture, a close-up view of the EST alignments. What they're saying is that the exon skipped variant is much less commonly expressed than the exon included variant, which I guess makes sense. It's missing part of the DNA binding domain. It probably can't do a lot. And But these are EST data. Like I said, they come from a lot of different data sources, a lot of different libraries. They could, this one single variant that's missing an exon could easily be an artifact. So that's why we need to look at other data. So this is an RNA-seq data set that's basically saying the same thing. We have a lot of aligned sequence reads and only a small number of them support the exon skipped variant. So we have two data sets, the same result. Two data sets made with entirely different technologies, different times and different laboratories, same result. And the same result from different sources increases our confidence that the result is real and not an artifact. So this is why we need to look at a lot of data a lot of different data sets that are kind of getting at the same biological process in different directions, using different technologies and different kinds of experiments. And one of the best, biggest sources of this kind of data is the UCSC Genome Browser Gateway System. It's a vast database. It's enormous. It's kind of amazing how big this thing is and how uh, well and thoroughly it's been supported over the years. So right now, I, I counted today, it has 220 genome assemblies in it, and it has hundreds of data tracks available for some species, particularly the human genome. And recently, fairly recently, the team has added computational access via a REST API, which means we might be able to modify our genome browser and bring in data from the UCSC genome browser and look at it in our software. And if we can do that, we can compare how it looks in our software with how it looks in the other genome browser, which will help us a lot. We'll make sure we're making it look right, for one thing. So here's how we did it. Um, here's an example of, so 
the REST API that they provide is simply just a set of endpoints that you query by constructing URLs. Very simple. This is what the URL looks like when you want to ask their API what tracks are available for a given genome. And in IGBY, the way we, in, the way we present that to users is we display folders um, under another folder called UCSC REST for REST API, not a super user-friendly way to, to explain it. And with the, underneath that, we have a bunch of categories, and these are very cryptic. These are names of file formats. That's not really that good. And here's, a, here's what happens when you open up one of those file formats called PSL. And down at the bottom, there's a little checkbox called spliced ESTs, aka intron EST. And that's what we were looking at in those tracks that I was showing you. And then there is the output of the computational API on the side. It's in JSON format that shows you what we had to read and interpret in order to make this interface. So probably you're looking at it and you're thinking, what is all of that? And that's kind of what we thought when we looked at it. <laughs> but what you're seeing is um, there's a short label, and that's what we've reproduced there. But there's a lot of other stuff that mostly has to do with how the genome browser at UCSC looks. And this is not really good. How is a user who looks at this supposed to know what to open and what to look at? And so, put some question marks. Would you know what those mean? If you've ever used the UCSC genome browser, you might. Now, that's a problem because we've designed integrated genome browser to support what we call link outs. So here's another example of a data set browser. And notice there's this little link out icon next to everything. And if a user clicks on that, it'll open a web page that tells you more about that data set. We've designed it that way. So what we need is a way for us, when we display these data in IGBY, an integrated genome browser, to link out to something that could explain what these data sets are. So this data delivery API that we're getting from UCSC, it, it's amazing. It's letting us show data in a way that we've never been able to do. But the API lacks information about the tracks. How are we to know what these tracks even mean? Can we add it? Can someone add it? But if we could, if we could somehow devise some sort of met metadata ontology or scheme or something like that, or perhaps use something that someone's already created, then we could make, we could help our audiences by allowing them to at least find out what these tracks actually are, where they came from. We could help our audiences do science, do better science faster. So here's one option, just add a new attribute or a new pair of, a new pair uh, to the API with an info URL, something simple, but I'm sure there's a lot more sophisticated and better options for that. So I want to thank uh, the people that did the work, um, Nolan Fries and uh, Jaya Shravani. And again, you can get the slides from that link. And I guess I'm done and we can answer some questions, I guess. Thank you. Thanks very much. If anybody has questions, just walk up to the mic. Um, th that sounds great. Does With UCS, you can make your own track hubs locally, and when you make a track hub locally, you have to fill out a page or make a, an attribute like you're describing. Can it be seen hubs or not? Um, actually, we have a, we, we actually have, um, I hadn't talked about it, but we, um, we developed a, what we're calling a track hub translator <laughs> that translates track hubs into an IGBY quick load format. Um, actually, I think we we're calling it uh, yeah, I, it's, it's on our website, uh, but Great. yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks for the question. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm actually curious about something you said very early on okay. um, about the uh, help desk or office hours. Yes. As resources, we're already always trying to figure out how to connect with our user community. Can you say any more about uh, how that works? how it's successful, any lessons? Oh, that's a great question. Um, we, we just started doing it in the last couple of months. And to be honest, we haven't gotten an awful lot of takers, which is part of why I'm here and telling you about it. <laughs> um, and we have, our whole team is going to lots of conferences this summer, and we're hoping that this will, that we can get the word out. Um, but, but yeah, 
um, no lessons learned at the moment other than be consistent and make sure people know how to how to um, join. <laughs> yeah. So there are a number of, of folks who, for various different reasons, are, are going to struggle with the two-dimensional gen genome browser display context uh, just kind of by definition. And so I was actually getting excited when you started talking about being able to pull in information from APIs provided by others. Is there any uh, talk amongst you all or in your community that you're aware of of leveraging the fact that now we can start shipping all this information around to actually represent it in a different way? Um, maybe let me ask the question of, hey, thing with tracks, <laughs> I would like to know if there's any where where reads are stacking up and have it mm. give me some coordinates or say, or come back and ask me, well, what do you mean by how much of a stack? Mm -hmm. um, because that's what I do with uh, situations where I need to use one of these. And I say, you, come here, help me with this. <laughs> and I tell them what to look for. So I'm wondering if there's any way to do that computationally so that I don't have to bother my colleagues. Oh, well, ab absolutely. <laughs> I mean, all of this data is online in various places. It's in the cloud, et cetera. So naturally, I mean, we could easily write code that would provide an interface, a query interface like that. We just haven't done it. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a great idea, and we absolutely would love to do something like that. <laughs> and with 